And for our next talk, we've got Ke Wang from Facebook and Jen Yusung from Princeton University. Uh, Ke is a software engineer at Facebook. She is currently developing uh, solutions to help low latency careers in Presto at Facebook. Uh, some of you who are familiar with us might have already heard a Ke's talk last year at our Data Orchestration Summit. Since then, we have continued to work together and furthered other collaborations. And this time we've added on Jen Yusung, who is currently pursuing his PhD at Princeton University's Computer Science Department. And he works on using machine learning to improve cache efficiency. Um, and they will present their work on improving Presto architectural decision with Shadow Cache. Take it away, Ke and Jen Yusung. Um, thank you. So, um, can everyone um, see my screen? Yep. Okay. Um, hi, uh, I'm Jerry Song, and uh, today I'm, I'm going to present together with Ke on improving Presto architecture decisions with Shadow Cache. We will um, explain our design and implementation of this new component, the shadow cache. So um, first, um, let me do a brief introduction. Uh, I'm Zheng Yusong, and oh, uh, just so I already introduced this, I'm a PhD student in Princeton University, and uh, my interest lies on uh, caching system. And to be specific, um, I'm working on the CDN, the content delivery network. And uh, right now, I'm trying to use machine learning to improve um, the caching system on the CDN. And uh, uh, Ke, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so although I usually refer myself to K because that's hard to pronounce for other people. So yeah, so my name is K. So I'm an engineer in Facebook. Uh, I joined Facebook around two and a half years ago. Uh, so my main focus is on the low latency queries uh, in Presto team. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so then let's talk about the the shadow cache. So why we need um, shadow cache? Um, the main motivation to uh, for cache shadow cache is to improve the cache operation decisions. Um, as a cache operator, um, we always hear. You know, they campaigning, okay, they have different questions. The there are two important questions for them. First, um, how to size my cache for each of the tenant. For example, um, in Presto team, um, they can have many tenants and each one wants a larger cache. Then how do they decide um what is the cache size for each of this tenant? If you give the a tenant um a small cache, this may improve no impact its performance but um if you give it a super large cache um it's going to um waste hours so what is the right way to do that and um second um what is the potential hit ratio improvement um for this uh for example for the presto team um they are interested in you know what if we use a better caching algorithm can we improve our um, current cache algorithm, the LRU one, what is uh, um, the gap to the LRU and um, does it work well for, for us to, to invest time and money into this improvement? So um, to solve these two questions, uh, we introduced the shadow cache. It is a lightweight Alexio component to track the working size size and infinite cache hit ratio. So here is a example, like how the shadow cache is going to answer uh, these questions. Um, if the operator question is how to size my cache for each tenant, and um, the shadow cache can answer this according to the measurement uh, it does for the total unique bytes and pages accessed in the past 24 hours. For example, if that's the most, um, you know, Thing, important thing user care about, and we can just size the cache roughly to this um, working size size range. And uh, for the second question, what is the potential hit ratio improvement? Uh, the shadow cache can tell you uh, what is the total number of hit or miss or the miss ratio if the cache can hold all the 24 hour requested pages. This means, you know, this gave an upper bound on how many, what is the maximum number of hit you can achieve 
with a equivalently infinite uh, large catch size. And um, so to do this tracking, to track the working size size and um, to track the infinite size heat ratio, um, there are three challenges. Um, the first two challenges are um, overhead and accuracy. Um, because um, we want a lightweight uh, model, we don't want to spend a lot of memory on this, and we also don't want our CPU uh, overhead to be increasingly large. And it also needs to be accurate, because um, to give the correct decisions, you will need accurate measurement. And the second challenge is dynamic update, um, because the workload size, working size size changing over time, um, we won't have a uh, accurate measurement uh, for different time as the workload adapts. We don't want to be have only a constant number, and um, when it gets stale, you may make wrong decisions. Okay, so how do we solve these challenges? Um, for the first challenge, the overhead, uh, for first two challenge, the overhead and accuracy challenge, um, we introduce a bloom filter. What is a bloom filter? Um, a bloom filter is a space uh, efficient probabilistic data structure, and it is used for membership testing. Um, so this data structure, um, it will it can tell you uh, whether uh, an element is in a set or not. And you can also put things into this data structure to put it into the as a set. And um, the intuition why the blue filter is space efficient is um, to store whether all object in the in the set, um, you don't actually need to store the key of the object. You can only store the the hash, in fact, because um, if someone asks you whether you see this object before, you can you don't need to check match each of the key. You just need to take the hash of the of the key and see okay whether I see this um, hash before, and this makes um, the storage uh, overhead um, extremely small. And um, to further increase the accuracy, uh, the Bruno filter applies multiple um, multiple hash algorithm, and each object is only represented by several bits. And um, it the Bruno filter is possibly have a false positive result, but um, it will not have false negative result. Which means if it says something in the cache. Uh, it may be not in the cache, but um, if it answer is okay, I didn't see this object before, then you are sure this is not in the cache. And um, for more detail, um, a blue filter is usually implemented with k hash function. And to add an element, um, you need to add, apply each of the hash functions and find the correct bit and set those bits to one. And to query an element, um, you also need to apply each of the hash functions and find those slots, and then you all all the bits and see if all the bits are one. So here is an example. Uh, suppose we want to insert object X, Y, and Z um, to the blue filter, and blue filter the inner line is just a, a bit map, a, a, a list of bits. Then what we do is we will apply um, here we have three hash functions on each of the object. And for example, for X, it points three locations. We will set the three location to be one. And we will do the same thing for Y and Z. And when we have a query uh, asking whether uh, object W is in the cache, we will, um, we will do the same hash functions and check the three positions. Because uh, while the position, the last position is zero, which means the blue filter have never insert W before. Okay, so why blue filter helps um, this problem? Because um, remember, our goal is to get the working size size and the infinite size hit ratio. And to get the infinite size uh, hit ratio, we can just query the blue filter and know whether uh, the object is in the blue filter, and if in the blue filter, which means if we have a large enough cache, we will have a hit instead of this. And to measure the working size size, uh, we can leverage uh, the approximation. There is a proof um, equation to estimate um, the number of atoms in there in the blue filter, um, and the equation is shown here. And 
uh, once you know the uh, the different parameters where M is the length of the filter, K is number of hash functions, X is the number of bits set to one, um, you can according to this uh, equation and calculate uh, the estimate number of atoms. Okay, so next let's talk about um, the third challenge, which is how do we dynamic update? Because a blue filter um, is limited in the way that it can only add object but not remove object, um, we introduce a chain of blue filter um, to solve the dynamic problem. Here, uh, our goal is trying to, uh, this example shows our goal is trying to track the object of the past 24 hours. And to do that, uh, we will have uh, a chain of four blue filters and each one joint, uh, tracks the disjoint um, six hour in the past. And the shadow cache is like this and is implemented by a chain of blue filters. And next, I will show some detail on how shadow cache works. So for the shadow cache, um, you can insert key into it. And when you insert the key, um, it will be inserted in the latest bloom filter. And um, you can query the shadow cache to see whether the object will get a hit or a miss. And to do the query, you will need to query each of the blue filters, see whether um, the key is in the blue filter, and do all operations, uh, all the results. So as long as one of the blue filter has the key, um, it will be present in the shadow cache. And um, when the algorithm runs over time, uh, after uh, each of the blue filter has expired, we will do the switch operation. For the switch operation, the oldest blue filter will be removed and the new blue filter will be added. And the last one is estimate working set size function. So to estimate uh, how many objects uh, have been seen in the past, we will all the, all the bits in the blue, all the blue filters and construct a new blue filter and using the statistic in this new blue filter, we will apply the equation and to estimate uh, the working set size. So here is the more concrete examples on um, what is the memory overhead of shadow cache. Um, to track 27 million pages, uh, which is um, 27 terabyte working set size, if you are zooming, um, each page is one megabyte, um, the current shadow cache uses 125 megabyte memory, and this will only cause 3% of errors, and which means um, this thing is really um, applicable to the current memory constraint, and um, the error is also uh, relatively small. And um, there are some assumptions here, like here we use four blue filters. I will talk about the case where, where you have larger number of blue filters. And uh, another note here is, you can see the memory overhead is actually regardless of the page key type. Uh, right now, the, the implementation, the Alexio page key is composed by a string and a long. So if you really want to string store the each of the key in the working size size, it's going to be, you know, taking um, taking gigabytes of memories or more than a tens of gigabytes because the string can be quite long, but using the shadow cache, you can do it pretty small memory overhead. And furthermore, we can uh, further reduce um, the, the um, working, um, sorry, the, the memory overhead by using the hyperlog log, which is also a probabilistic data structure. Um, but that will have a problems. Uh, it does not su support um, infinite size heat ratio estimation. So let's talk about more about the implementation. Um, right now, um, we use the Guava Bloom filter libraries, and uh, we can also automatically select the Bloom filter configurations. So the user don't have to worry about uh, what is the best configuration to use, which like the number of bits in the Bloom filter, number of hash functions. Um, the user only need to specify the memory overhead budget and also the shadow cache window, which is like what is the time range you are interested in of the working set. And uh, we support working set size estimation in terms of number of pages 
or number of bytes if your um, your page size is not a uh, uni unisize. And we also support infinite um, size mixed ratio calculation in terms of byte hit ratio and object hit ratio. The object hit ratio is count hit for each of the pages, and byte hit ratio is count hit for each of the bytes. If your um, same, if your uh, page is not unisized. Okay. So um, next, uh, I will um, explain how do you use um, this shadow cache. Right now, the shadow cache is merged into the main branch. And to use it, um, it's quite easy. You just need to specify um, three lines of config. And uh, it's actually four lines. Uh, there is another enable um, config, which I omit here, but you just need to set it to be true. And after that, um, what you need to do is to set the window size, the memory overhead, and the number of blue filter. For example, here, um, if you're interested in um, tracking the workload of the past 24 hours, you just set the, uh, the window size to be 24 hour, and the memory overhead, you can set it to be 125 megabytes, and number of blue filters, um, you just set it to be four. Okay. So um, to conclude, uh, we designed the shadow cache. Um, it's a lightweight Alexa component to track the working size size and um, the infinite cache hit ratio. Uh, the code is merged into the master branch. And um, there are many op uh, optimization opportunities. Um, for example, you can further optimize the memory overhead or the CPU overhead. Um, those are the uh, valuable future directions to pursue. OK, thank you. So um, could you want me to help you um, roll the pages? Yeah, please. Yeah. OK. All right. You can just um, tell me next page. Yeah, sure. All right. Yeah, thanks, Jenyu, for explaining the implementation of uh, Shadow Cache. Next, uh, I will talk about the usage of Shadow Cache on Presto. Uh, next slide. Uh, so Shadow Cache is mainly used for the project RaptX, uh, which is the overall caching solution built on top of Presto to boost the query performance by at least 10x. Uh, I won't go to uh, too much detail on this one, uh, you can refer to the post on Presto website or previous Tech Talk uh, to learn more about uh, Project Reptex. Uh, so as of now, uh, Presto is using Alexio as its data caching. Uh, next slide. Uh, is it empty? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, one pain point uh, is that we don't know how large the caching uh, working set is. So we have limited flash storage on every Presto worker. And we want to understand if a cluster is bounded by the storage, meaning if it is, then adding more storage is going to help uh, with the cache hit rate and thus help with the end-to-end -end query latency. But if it, it isn't, then there's no need to do so. Uh, secondly, like Jen, you mentioned, uh, Shadow Cache would be also helpful to explore and evaluate the potential improvements in the new caching algorithm. Uh, right now, we are using plain LRU, uh, but more sophisticated eviction policy could potentially bring up the cache hit rate. Uh, lastly, we also want to optimize the routing algorithm for better uh, balance and efficiency. Uh, I will explain a little bit more on, on the last one. Uh, next slide. So for the routing logic, right now we shard the cache among clusters based on table name, meaning every cluster has a set of cache, uh, a set of tables uh, to cache. Uh, and the query that access the same table will always go to the same target cluster to maximize its cache. Uh, next slide. So um, unfortunately, under such uh, architecture, 
even though from the storage perspective, the cache is very uh, evenly distributed. But from the compute perspective, we could see imbalance uh, when certain clusters are more overloaded in CPU than others. Um, so to solve this issue, we have several options. Uh, next slide. Uh, can you do some more? Yeah. Uh, and one more, I think. Uh, and one more, yeah, all right. Yeah, so we have several options. Uh, first, we can introduce a secondary cluster when primary cluster is busy. And we have uh, the designated secondary cluster that will also have the cache turned on for those queries, but it will require uh, storing additional tables on each cluster. Uh, the option two is that we can have two clusters, both serving as the primary clusters and do load balancing between them, which requires uh, each cluster to store two sets of the tables compa compared to the original design. So you will take about 2x of the cache space. Um, the third option is to shuffle the tables around between the clusters to make the CPU uh, distribution uh, more even based on the query uh, pattern. But it could take, uh, it could make the storage distribution not even and thus require uh, extra space uh, as well. So for all the solutions above, we need to understand how it will affect the cache efficiency when we do a trade-off between uh, the cluster balance and extra uh, cache space storage. So, and that's where uh, Shadow Cache is coming to rescue. Uh, the next slide. Uh, yeah. All right. So, uh, Shadow Cache is able to give us insights on the size of the working set and how cache hit rate would look like if we have infinite uh, cache space. So we will observe the following metrics. Uh, so first, the real cache usage at a certain point of time. Also, we monitor the shadow cache working set and the real cache heat rate and how the shadow cache heat rate look like. So based on those, um, next slide. Uh, we will have this decision tree that help uh, that helps us understand the current health of the cache system. So first, we usually look at the shadow cache hit rate. Um, if the shadow cache hit rate is low, it means even if we add unlimited cache capacity, we still wouldn't get a very good cache hit rate. Um, in other words, the traffic is not cache friendly. So one possible reason behind that is the data is continuously updated user are more concerned about the new data and there's not much data repetitiveness uh, in the query pattern. So in such case, neither adding cache capacity or moving the tables out of the cluster would help. So on the other side, when the cache hit rate, uh, when the shadow cache hit rate is good, then we look at the real cache hit rate if the real cache hit rate is low, it means that we do have some opportunities there. We have room for improvement. So in scenario B, where the working set is much larger than the real usage, it means that if we add more capacity, we will get better performance. Um, in such case, adding additional capacity or moving some tables out of the cluster would help with the cache hit rate. Uh, but if the real cache uh, hit rate is also high, then it means our caching system is already doing pretty good. Um, and if the working set is really small, uh, like in this scenario D, then it means our cache uh, system is kind of under underused uh, and is open to accept more items in the in the cache. Uh, so it turns out in Facebook we actually fall into uh, category D, where our cache space uh, has room for more. And we end up uh, leveraging that fact uh, for further improvement on our routing strategy. Uh, yeah, 
that's about it from my side. So I think we do have a few minutes left. So feel free to ask questions if you have any. Wonderful, thank you for your talk. Uh, and David and our team will help moderate some of the questions. Yeah, I know it's a very exciting talk. And I think the, the very first question that I have is uh, um, under this, uh, so can, can you envision that using shadow cache, something like shadow cache, can we dynamically adjust the uh, the cluster, uh, you know, for example, Aluxo worker size to uh, to have better ROI, ROI on our cache? No, just not just uh, as an observation uh, way, like a way to monitor, but a way to act on it as well. Do you mean on uh, Presto cluster size, like dynamically yeah, adjusting, adjusting that. Presto cluster size, for example? Yeah, that's a good point. I think that's the next step we are going to to move uh, towards. Uh, but right now we are because our cluster is bounded by multiple factors for example memory or cpu or uh, the storage uh, if the cluster is not bounded by cpu or memory and only bounded by the storage like the cache storage then yes we can do the dynamic uh, resizing according to the shadow cache results cool Yeah, I don't have any uh, other questions here. Oh, actually, we have some in the Slack channel that I pulled from the uh, platform. Oh. Uh, a question from Slack channel is, how do you initialize the size of the bloom filter? And how do you deal with any false positives when the bloom filter is undersized? Uh, would it uh, result in uh, overestimating a hit rate in this case? Yes, um, let me let me explain this two question one by one. Uh, first is um, how do uh, is how to size the bloom filter, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, the bloom filter um, the 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 input or the user has a memory budget, and that is something. Um, we will just obey it, and after that, um, um, it determines the number of bits you can use for the bloom filter. Um, the then um, there is a, a changeable parameter is number of bloom filter you can use. So if you have a higher number of bloom filter, this means um, each bloom filter will have a, a smaller number of bits, which will cause it has a higher um, higher error. But on the other hand, um, this also makes the, the estimation more um, dynamic because uh, the current uh, the limitation is uh, when, you, when you do a switch operations, um, the old broom filter, one of the old broom filter get dropped and you lose one over ends um, of, the, of the bits you store. So um, to store this, um, currently uh, our heuristic is uh, uh, using four, but um, the user can adjust based on their needs. And uh, the second question is about uh, the arrows. Uh, so uh, right now we imagine the, the, the arrow should be pretty small given the, the high efficiency, but uh, we do consider what if the arrow is high. Uh, the first thing we have is um, there is a metric exposed um, um, calculating the uh, the false positive error of the bloom filter. So um, so if you the user can see the metric goes up, they they may need to consider you know adding uh, more space to that. And um, in terms of the calculation, um, like what are the error causes, um, if you have a high error, then um, the the estimation of the working size size should be uh, relatively uh, stable because that's already considered the error into into account the the approximation, but the the hit ratio um, approximation 
may not be uh, be accurate because um, you will have a, a overly high estimation of heat because assuming your your blue filter is too small and you quickly get all the bits set so you will just assuming like all the objects you see are in the blue filter so like the heat ratio like in the extremely case is 100 percent which should not be true thank you thank you yeah i think that's uh, all the questions okay thank you okay wonderful and thank you david and thank you uh jenny uh and Ke. Uh, for the great presentation. Uh, and then 